Okay, so welcome everyone early this morning uh, for the last lecture today in this module on photogrammetry one and two. So the goal today is to provide a short summary about the main thing that we have done in the photogrammetry two course. First putting this a little bit into context of the, of the overall module. So whereas in photogrammetry one we mainly looked into image uh, processing or image interpretation tasks, things like classification, um, dimensionality reduction, segmentation, um, and looking also into the geometry of single images, so having only one single images, trying to infer some knowledge about the geometry of the scene or the location of the camera. In photogrammetry 2, we looked into more than one camera image. So we started with the geometry for the camera pair, so having either a stereo camera, so a physical stereo camera consisting of two cameras, or multiple images taken with potentially one camera from different location. And the question, what can we say about the location of those cameras, about the things that we see in the environment, and how does this generalize to situations where we have N camera images? And last but not least, how can we incorporate also information about the motion of that sensor into the system? So everything in photogrammetry 2 was actually related to the geometry of the scene, given that we have more than one image. And this was kind of the overall topic. So we started first with saying, OK, what can we say about the geometry of the image pair? So having two images. Um, we looked into things like the epipolar geometry. So this was important if we have a stereo setup and we want to identify, given that we see distinct points, in both images, and we kind of want to find a cor uh, for one cor uh, point or distinct point that we found in one image, we want, want to find the, cor the corresponding point in the other image. And how can we simplify the search? Which constraints um, do we have to take into account? This can be very well expressed with the epipolar geometry. Given that we have those corresponding points, we then looked into the question, how can we actually determine the relative orientation of two cameras? So given one camera is here, where does the second camera sit relative to that first camera? And the, we started with that with something which is called the direct solution. That means the solution where we don't need any initial guess. Based on the location of points, or, or based on the correspondences of points in the environment that we observe, we are able to actually identify the relative orientation of those two cameras. What we don't know is where those points are in a global reference frame. And what we don't know is information about the scale, unless we have additional information. Because we could scale up and down the see all the objects, as well as the location of the cameras, and we would still get the same images. So it's something that we cannot identify. And we said, OK, we have this direct solution where we can directly compute um, the relative orientation of um, the, the cameras where the images have been taken. Uh, but it was not a statistically optimal solution not taking into account all the uncertainties. And therefore, we then looked into a least squares approach to solve this, where we can take the direct solution as an initial guess and solve this through a least squares approach. At that point, we said, OK, we now have a solid mechanism to estimate the relative orientation of two camera images given corresponding points. Then we said, OK, now, given we know those camera locations, what can we say about the scene points? And then basically by triangulation, estimate where those points are in the environment. Then we generalized this problem, estimating the relative orientation of the two cameras and the uh, feature location of, um, in the environment as a joint estimation problem, which then led to the bundle adjustment problem, where we want to estimate the location and uh, heading of the individual cameras, as well as the uh, 3D location of feature points in the environment. One of the applications of the bundle adjustment problem is, for example, um, aerotriangulation. So if we fly with an airplane, take images of the ground, and we want to estimate um, the location of distinct point in, um, in those settings. And then we look into the question, what are actually good distinct or distinctive features? So far, we just assumed that we have corresponding points. And we looked into the question, how do we find those corresponding points? Looked into one instance of those features, the SIFT features but there are definitely others around. And the question, how do we match them? How do we deal with the wrong data cessation, which then uh, led to the RANSEC algorithm? And last but not least, we looked into recursive estimation for online processing. That means, so far, we always assumed all the data is available beforehand. 
And now we kind of said, okay, we want to estimate always the current state of the system up to the current time step t and we advance the time step t um, in every, for, for every step. And we always want to update our belief without recomputing everything. And the question is how can we efficiently update our belief, so evolve the belief from time t minus 1 to t. And we, um, we, we looked more deeply into one instance of this recursive Bayesian estimation technique of the base filter, which was the Kalman filter, extended Kalman filter, and then um, had an idea or presented a technique on how to solve the problem very similar to the bundle adjustment problem in the sense that we want to estimate the location of the sensor at every point in time and the location of features in the environment um, using this recursive estimation approach and are also able to take into account information about the motion of such a system. So it's kind of the overall context, what we have done. So we started from the image pair and then always added more geometric information that we could infer. First, the location of those cameras, then the location of those points given those cameras, then we looked into this as a joint um, estimation problem, and then into an online estimation problem. So it was kind of the path through those techniques. And what I want to do now, or today, is kind of go very, very briefly, of course, just with two or three slides over every chapter that we have done in this course, and kind of remind you about some of the key concepts that we addressed or discussed in there. That's definitely not sufficient for covering the whole course, of course, but um, at least should give you an idea what are important elements um, that we have discussed in the course and kind of guide you a little bit through, through the overall uh, photogrammetry 2 course. So if you look at the geometry, one of the key things that we looked into, which is an essential part, is the coplanarity constraint. So given that we have know the orientation of our camera, so we know where the camera are located and where they are looking to, and we have perfect information about that and perfect um, information about the corresponding points, so no data association problems, and we can measure our points perfectly. Then we can actually span a triangle between the projection centers of our two cameras, so the first camera and the second camera, and the point in the environment. And this had, all those three points must lie in a plane, so this must form a plane. If these are not the same points, so these are actually two different points, let's say lying on different heights, this will not be a plane. So by the constraint that this must be the same point, um, these three points form a plane. If we make a wrong data association, or we have noise in our process, those rays here may not point exactly to the same point, and this introduces an error. And this coplanarity constraint was one of the, the key constraints that we then used later on to derive information about the relative orientation of those two camera locations. For example, for computing the fundamental matrix or for computing the essential matrix. So it's one of the important constraints that we exploited. The second thing we noted is that what our cameras do, we are basically, what we're doing, we're basically observing so-called bundles of rays. So bundles because we have multiple rays and they all path through the projection center of our camera. So what we basically see, we see a lot of directions. It's a direction measurement device. So we're basically measuring angles between features. And so if you, if you have only the information from those camera images and don't have any additional information, we can only derive an angle-preserving model of the object or of the scene that we are actually looking into. So we can't, for example, identify the scale. Of course, you could scale up and down the environment and would still have the same relations of the, the angles between those points. And because the cameras, as long as we don't have any additional information, we are only observing those angles, we can't infer more about the scene. If we, for example, have additional information about the baseline, also the lines of that baseline, it looks differently because then we have additional information and we can infer more about the environment. So one example that we had, so if we have an image taken here in this center, uh, projection center or from the camera, where the projection center is here or one we observe those rays over here and we take an image from the second camera over here. And we may have a third camera sitting over here. Then, under certain constellations, one the object looks like this and the second one the object looks like this, 
those two camera images are exactly the same. So it means if we kind of scale up and down the scene, which can be seen here by scaling up and down those boxes, and at the same time move the camera along this ray, then we actually obtain exactly the same image. That means if we only have the information that we have those two images, we can't identify the size of the objects in the scene and where we are along these lines. So we have a degree of freedom in there. This was a scale. So we, if we only have the information about the images, we can't fix the scale. For that, we need additional information. If we know the size of one of those objects, or if we know the distance between the projection centers, then we have information about the scale. We can use this to kind of fix this degree of freedom that we have. What we also cannot identify are the six degrees of freedom specifying kind of where the first camera is sitting or is located in the environment. Therefore, this is called the relative orientation. We have the relative orientation between those two cameras, but we do not know where the relative constellation of cameras sits in the world. Therefore, if you do an estimation like this, we typically, the resulting model has typically seven degrees of freedom. This is, we do not know the x, y, that location in the global reference frame, as well as not the orientation, and we do not know the scale. So these are those seven parameters. So we don't know the global translation and rotation because we only know something about the relative orientation of the two cameras. And we don't, we don't know anything about the scale. Unless we have additional information. So if we know, for example, a couple of those points, their coordinates in a world reference frame, then, as we will see later on in the absolute orientation, we can actually compute the location also in the global reference frame. But if we only see corresponding points from those camera images, we simply cannot identify that. Then we looked into the epipolar geometry, and this is one technique to describe the geometric relations between two camera images and corresponding points. And um, one of the key advantages of this epipolar geometry is that given I have, I identify a point in image number one that I regard as a distinct point, or a point for which I want to estimate, um, for example, the 3D location in the environment. The question is, where do I find this corresponding point the corresponding point in the second image. And by exploiting those constraints that we can identify through this epipolar geometry, this actually boils down to a line in the other image. So I just need to search along a line for the corresponding point, which reduces my search space from a 2D problem where I have to search through the whole image into a 1D problem where I only have to search along a line. And this is two advantages. The first advantage is faster, because I just need to inspect less pixels for those correspondences. And the second advantage is if I have less possibilities to check, there's a smaller probability of making an error. Because there could be multiple points in the environment that look very similar, and maybe only one of those points lies along this, this so-called epipolar line, this 1D search space. And then the probability of making a wrong data association is reduced. So it's a twofold advantage. It's faster and the probability of making a wrong data association is typically reduced because there are less possibilities where those points can be. This is one of the very essential drawings in this course. So what you see here, this is the camera image number one, you have the camera image number two, and we have one corresponding point X over here. And so we have this triangle here between the baseline and those points X, so between O prime, O double prime, and X, and those points lie within one plane. So if you shoot a ray from here through O1 along, this, along X, the only thing we know from this single image is that the point X lies somewhere on this line because we are only measuring angles. We don't know how far this point X is away. If we just have one image, we only know point X lies on this line. And so the second image can be used to identify where this point X is in the, in the real world. So to search for this point X of, or for the kind of pixel that corresponds to point X in this image, what we need to do, we need, basically need to project this line into this image. Because from this image we know the point must lie on this line, somewhere on this line. 
So we project this line into this image over here. We know that this point x must lie somewhere on this line. And this is kind of this 1D search space. And this is this epipolar line over here. Uh, sorry, this one over here. <coughs> if we have a different point we are looking for, for example, the point y over here, then the line looks different. So this, this line over here, kind of behind, below this plane, ends up over here. If we would project this point to this image, we get a different AP polar line. This is this line over here. So this line is the projection of this line here, which corresponds to the point y into this image. So different points in the world will generate or can generate different AP polar lines. And this is the, the points in the, or the lines along the image, this 1D search space that I have to look for. But all the points go through these AP poles. This is the AP pole, and this is the AP pole. And the AP pole is the projection of the projection center of the other camera into this image. So this AP pole is the projection of this point into this camera image and the other way around. And all AP polar lines path through this AP pole. So we have a couple of lines over here and along these lines we need to look for corresponding points. And there are important things like the so-called AP polar axis or baseline over here, this B is an important element in here. We have the AP polar plane, so this is 4x, this is the whole plane which is spent by O prime, O double prime at x, so the epipolar plane. We have the, ep the epipoles, which are just explained, and the epipolar lines, which are multiple different lines which pass through the images, which are the different epipolar lines generated for a point in the environment. These are kind of these four key elements of the epipolar geometry. So this is kind of, this is a very basic knowledge that I expect every one of you to know what the epipolar geometry is and what the idea behind it is and what it can be used for. Okay, having this information, we say, we know that this is a plane, the points must lie in a plane. We can actually exploit those constraints to compute something which is called the fundamental matrix. And the fundamental matrix is a matrix which encodes the relative orientation of two uncalibrated camera images. So we have an uncalibrated camera and then we can, we can the, the fundamental matrix encodes the relative orientation of those two images recorded with this uncalibrated camera. And it has kind of this form, it's also a very important form. So what it basically has, it has consists of five elements which are the calibration matrices of the individual cameras, first camera, second camera. It contains the orientations of where are those cameras pointing to, and it contains the information about the baseline. So how far those cameras are away, in which direction they are away from each other. <coughs> and this is encoded in this screw symmetric matrix. And the important thing is that we can use the fundamental matrix to have a test if two points lie within the same plane. So exploit this coplanarity constraint. Having in this form, so if this is the pixel coordinate in image number one of a distinct point, and this is a pixel coordinate of image number two, or in image number two of the same corresponding point. And given that there's no noise in the process, and given that the uh, fundamental matrix is determined correctly, this should be should equal to zero. If this is a value different from zero, it basically means those points do not lie in the same plane. The reason for this can be noise because you cannot nail down the exact location of this corresponding point in your image. So if you have a small noise, you may have here a small deviation from zero or because you simply selected the wrong corresponding points, because there are multiple objects in the image which look identical. And then you typically have a larger deviation in here, unless those points 
incidentally lie exactly in the same plane, although they're not corresponding. Of course, this can also be the case. Then it would be zero. So having zero is no guarantee that your data association is correct. But if it's unequal to zero, the points do not lie in a plane. If the deviation is small, it's typically due to noise or likely due to noise. If there's large deviation, it's quite likely that one made a wrong data association. And this was for the uncalibrated camera. And then there's a specialization of the essential matrix, of the fundamental matrix, sorry, which is called the essential matrix. And it's exactly the same as a fundamental matrix, but for calibrated cameras. So we assume the camera is calibrated and we already get the, we measure those, the pixels already in a calibrated form, so we know the direction of those angles. So we basically have exactly the same form, except that the calibration matrices are not there anymore because we know that the points are already here in the camera frame uh, or already properly calibrated. And then we can do exactly the same thing. We can express a coplanarity constraint for the calibrated camera in this form with the essential matrix. In exactly the same way we did it for the fundamental matrix. And we looked into techniques, how can we estimate those elements from corresponding points? So how do we come up estimating E? How do we come up estimating F from the knowledge that we have corresponding points? If we have all the parameters like the rotation, the baseline information, we can directly compute E. If we have E, we can also infer knowledge about those parameters. The question was then, how do we actually parameterize the relative orientation of two images? And we looked into kind of diff three different ways to do that. The, and they are work in different ways. So the one thing is the first camera, the one typical, for, at least for the first two parameterizations, the first assumption is we put the first camera into the reference frame. And then we have um, a direction of this vector B, which tells me in which direction the other camera sits. As we don't know anything about the scale, the length of this vector is fixed to one. That's an additional constraint that we have in this first parameterization. And then we have a rotation matrix that tells us how the second camera is looking. And this is kind of the most popular parameterization, so the general parameterization of dependent images. This is another form which is similar to the first one, but the baseline, the base is differently encoded. And here, the thing is that the the x component is kind of fixed to a constant value, larger than zero. That's fine, that works well. This is something which comes from, um, the aerial, from generating aerial images, where you, this x was your flying direction. So if you expose images at different points in time, so you will be at different locations. You've moved along this x vector. But whenever you have a different geometric setup where the difference in x between the projection centers is zero, this leads to numerical problems. And the third thing is you can also express this through um, just rotation, two rotation matrices, um, the relative orientation. But the most popular one is this one over here. So the important thing is we have a rotation matrix which tells us how does a second camera sit with respect to the first one. The first one defines the local reference frame. And then we have a base vector um, which is constrained in its length, so it's supposed to have length one. And therefore we have this, we have five degrees of freedom involved in here. Five, not six, because we don't basically know how far the cameras are apart. So along this base vector, this camera can move. And therefore we have only five degrees of freedom, not six. And if we, as we only know five degrees of freedom, we kind of have this scale ambiguity. If we fix this, and we know six parameters, then the scale is also fixed. Okay? Okay, then we looked into the question, how do we actually find those matrices? How can we compute F? How can we compute E? And we started with saying, okay, given we have two images taken of the same object but from different locations, and we know corresponding points. So we know, for example, that this point in this image corresponds to this point over here. And this one corresponds to this one. And this guy corresponds to this guy. And so on and so forth. So we have those correspondences. Then we can use those correspondences to compute the fundamental matrix or the essential matrix. And then also estimate those, the orientation parameters. 
The important thing was here, we do not know where those corresponding points are in the environment. We only know that they are corresponding points. There have been some constraints, like shouldn't lie all within one plane, but um, we don't need to know the 3D location of those points in the world. And the question was, how do we actually compute the fundamental matrix giving only those corresponding points? We started out, okay, we have this coplanarity constraint, and this holds for every of these corresponding points. So if you have 10 corresponding points, we have 10 of those equations. And for our approach, we did at least eight. So it's the eight-point algorithm that we looked into. So the idea is to say, okay, we simply have at least, or we have eight of those equations over here. You can also reformulate this and just write it in a different form, and then we can be expressed in this way. That means x and y coordinate of the corresponding point in the first image and x and y coordinate of the corresponding point in the second image. And then we have the nine elements of my fundamental matrix in here. Now we simply have multiple of those equations. We can simply compute the product of those uh, vectors and this matrix. And then we basically get system of linear equations that we need to solve. And where the unknowns are those elements in our matrix F. So they are. These are those measured coordinates. I have this relation, and then these are my unknowns. So how do I need to determine the different elements in F so that this equation holds? And then we came up with an algorithm for doing this, which was the eight point or the basic eight point algorithm for doing this. So the things we first built the system of linear equations using the Kronecker product. And then we basically solved this system, which is basically with a matrix A times a vector F, where F was kind of the vector consisting of the nine unknowns, equals to zero. This is something we can solve as SVD. So we use the singular value decomposition to solve this system. And now we had one thing to consider that these, uh, the fundamental matrix has um, certain constraints. So it is a homogeneous matrix. So we can multiply it with a scalar and it doesn't hurt. And the second thing is that it had a rank deficiency. It has rank two. So one of its eigenvalues must be zero. And therefore, we first compute an approximation of F as just the solution of the SVD. And then we build up our best estimate of this matrix F, where we took the first eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue of our approximation, the second largest one, and the last one, the third one, we set to zero, because this was the, the rank deficiency that we need to impose into this matrix F. OK? So this was kind of, we said we have our, our observations. They are not perfect. So we compute from that the fundamental matrix. But given that not everything is perfect, the last eigenvalue, the smallest eigenvalue, is likely to be very small, but it is not zero. We need to impose this constraint that it is zero because the fundamental matrix has to have rank two. And we do this by simply setting the smallest eigenvalue to zero. OK? This was the direct approach for computing the um, is, is a fundamental matrix. What this approach does not take into account, for example, is the uncertainty which we measure those points. So they are, therefore, it's supposed to be not the optimal solution for computing this, but it's a direct solution where I don't need any initial guess. And typically, this is used as an initial guess for least squares approach, which takes into account all the uncertainties. For example, how accurately can I nail down the individual corresponding points? And then we did basically the same thing for the essential matrix as well. So, OK, we can make exactly the same expression for the essential matrix. We'll have exactly the same system of linear equations. We have our nine unknowns over here. And then we basically do the same procedure. But there's a small difference. The essential matrix has 
less degrees of freedom because it's for the calibrated camera. So the degrees of freedom from the, cali from the, from the calibration do not um, influence the matrix. Therefore, we have more constraints in here. So for the fundamental matrix, we had the constraint that we have only two eigenvalues which are larger than zero and they are different from each other. And this last element is zero. For the essential matrix, those two eigenvalues must be the same. So they are kind of both take the value of D. And since the fundamental matrix as well as the central matrix um, is a homogeneous matrix, that means only known up to a scaling factor, we can simply move the scaling, the scaling factor D out and simply have ones over here. <coughs> and this imposes more constraints, gives us exactly the same algorithm as for the essential matrix, a fundamental matrix, except that the two eigenvalues here are set to one and the last one to zero. So this is the only difference over here between the essential matrix and the fundamental matrix. Again, essential matrix and fundamental matrix are two very basic concepts that we discussed here in the course. And knowledge about how does the essential matrix look like, how does the fundamental matrix look like, is very important. And we said, okay, can we do better than you requiring those eight points? And yes, there is a better solution to that. This is a five-point algorithm by Nista. We haven't discussed this approach in detail, so I don't expect any in-depth knowledge about, or any real knowledge about this algorithm, but it's kind of a very, very popular algorithm which is used in most system for co systems today for computing the relative orientation. And therefore, at least one have it mentioned here that if you, in the end, try to build one of those systems yourself for computing the relative orientation from images, you will probably rely on the five-point algorithm, not on the eight-point algorithm. Why? Because you will have to bundle this approach with RANSEC in order to identify potential outliers. And as you remember in the chapter on RANSEC, the performance of RANSEC, how many trials you need, dramatically depends on the parameter how many inliers you need to sample, so how many correspondences you need to sample, which are all inliers. And if you need to only sample five corresponding points instead of eight corresponding points, you will need a substantially lower number of, 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 of trials in RANSEC to come up to guarantee a certain quality of the solution. And this is one of the reasons why this approach is so popular and so frequently used, because you only need five correspondences and not eight correspondences which dramatically reduces the number of trials that I need for RANSEC. It's kind of the interplay between those parameters and those components. Okay, so these are the direct solutions to this problem. Then we looked into an iterative solution for computing the essential matrix. So why is this needed? I said before is that <clears throat> we do not, in the, in the direct solution, we do not take all the information that we potentially have into account. For example, the uncertainties, <coughs> the uncertainty about how accurately we, we can um, locate points in our images. And having uncertain point locations introduces an uncertainty, and it introduces an uncertainty in the individual parameters of the essential matrix or the fundamental matrix that we are computing. So if my points are all a little bit off, of course, I will get a different relative orientation. And taking this information into account in the process of estimating the essential matrix is something that we would like to have. We would like to take this uncertainty into account and we in the end also want to make a statement how certain we are about the different parameters of the essential matrix. And therefore, we used standard least squares, iterative nonlinear least squares approach for solving this problem. Using, for example, the results from the eight-point algorithm as an initial guess, and then using the initial guess for deriving the, all the individual elements that we need for a least squares approach. So our uh, Jacobians need to be set up, and um, so we need to linearize our error function, build up a system of linear equations, solve the system of linear equation, and iterate this process because there are nonlinearities involved in here. And we did this in detail for the stereonormal case, 
I don't expect you to remember all those equations that we used in there. So they're quite equation-heavy derivation. I don't expect you to know the, all the expect, exact details of this derivation for the exam. What's important to know is what happened there, what are the key, key ideas of this iterative process, um, but I don't expect you to know these equations for the exam. Given this approach, we did this for the stereo normal case because the mass got it was, was a little bit easier, um, but the technique was exactly the same as it would do this for the general case, except that the derivations get more complicated. And the, the mass simply gets more complicated, but not, uh, or more, but not more complex. Um, if we use this process, start with the eight-point algorithm as the initial guess, compute the solution over here, we obtain the Assuming the, the right correspondences are picked, we get the optimal solution for computing the, um, the, the relative orientations of the essential matrix. We can also directly derive the uncertainties of the individual quantities in here. At that point of the, exam of the course, we said, okay, now we know the relative orientation of images. Now let's see what we can do with this relative orientation. One of the things we can do is triangulation. So given that we know the relative orientations or the locations from where those images have been taken, we can infer information about the three location of points in the scene. So as I said before, we observe this point over here and observe the same point from this location and same for the other point. We know that those point lies here is in space and the other point, so these are those two points in space. So from the relative orientation, we can infer the location of those points. Of course, we can only do this if we know the relative location only um, up to a similarity transform, so we don't know anything about how far those um, projection centers are, the way, are away from each other. We also only know the, um, the 3D model up to a similarity transform. So we don't know anything about the scale, and we don't know where the thing sits in our global reference frame. So how can we do that? Then we looked into kind of first a geometric approach saying, okay, um, image one, image two, uh, sorry, sorry um, camera, camera one, camera two, these are those two rays, and where do those rays intersect? There's my triangulated point. The problem that we have is that those points may not intersect in the 3D world. So we said, okay, we simply look for the points along those rays, so where the distance is minimal between those two rays, and so we have the, connect, the shortest connecting line, which sits orthogonal on those, those two rays. And the center of this point is one approach for computing the, um, the 3D location of the point in the environment. This was kind of the geometric approach that we looked into. Then what we also said, we again looked into the stereo normal case. Again, stereo normal case, we have two cameras. They are both point to the same direction. Rotation matrix is the identity matrix, and the offset is only a shift in the x direction. So they only shifted in x. There is no shift, for example, in depth or in the y coordinate. So only shift in x. Okay. So in this example, we have these two images, both looking downwards, observing, observing this point. And the, the important thing is that if we have two corresponding points, they basically lie um, both on this line over here through those images. They're both on the same y coordinate. They have different x coordinates, but the same y coordinate in both images. Of course, we have kind of this triangle over here. And then we use this basically the um, theorem of intersecting rays or Strahlensatz to derive the different quantities in here. So, how does the z coordinate look like? How does the x coordinate look like? Which sits up over here. And how does the y coordinate look like? Which give the result over here. So the important things in here was, um, okay, for the x coordinate, so for the z coordinate, it depends on B, so the basis between the two cameras. It depends on the camera constant, and it depends on the parallax, so the difference in the x coordinates. Very similar for the x coordinate. Same equation, except that the camera constant is replaced by the um, pixel location of the point in our first camera image. And 
for the y coordinate, it basically depends on the average y coordinate. Or if both are perfectly aligned, so in a perfect stereo normal case, it would be just y prime. But what we do is we basically average over the y coordinate. Um, they should be the same, but again, it's, we have, we are never living in a perfect world. Therefore, we simply compute the mean out of those two points, which gives us this basic expression over here for the x coordinate, y coordinate, and z coordinate. And the important thing is the key quantity in here is just this parallax. So, what's the difference in the measured x coordinates of the corresponding pixels? And the difference in the measured x coordinates in the two images basically tells me, gives me all the information that I need about the point. So, where is it? The difference means how far it is away. The x coordinate itself tells me where I'm along the x coordinate, of course, and the, the y coordinate. Uh, as inference where you're on the y coordinate. But all these elements contain this, this x parallax. And the x parallax tells you something about how far the point is away. And the y parallax should be zero in the perfect world. As we're not living in a perfect world, it should at least be close to zero. <coughs> then we also looked into the quality of those 3D points. So how accurately can we nail down those points? We got some information about the uncertainty in the x coordinate, which basically depends how accurately can I measure the point in my image. So the more accurately I can nail down the pixel coordinate of the point, the more accurately I will determine it is x coordinate. I guess kind of obvious. But it also depends how far that point is away. And the same holds for the y coordinate. So the further the point is away, the higher the noise in the process. So if a point which is very far away, it's more uncertain than a point which is close. And for, um, I also have the, the relative precision um, for the, so the z-coordinate is basically the relation of the uncertainty in the z-coordinate and how far the point is away has the same relation than how accurately I can actually measure my parallax and the parallax itself. What you typically get, you have this kind of uncertainty field of points. So these are kind of the stereo camera up here. These are different points. And this is an illustration on how accurate, sorry, how accurately you typically can measure the points, given that you can determine the corresponding points in both camera image with the same uncertainty. So you see also the point, the further they are away from the camera, the more uncertain they get. And the closer they are, the better they are. The basically, the reason is the further the point moves away, the smaller this angle gets, and the higher the uncertainty is in the estimation process. OK, so this was kind of the triangulation. So given we know the relative orientation of those point, of, of two cameras, how can we estimate where those points are in the world? Then the next thing we said is, OK, let's combine this with an absolute orientation. So if we for some of the points in the world, know their real 3D coordinates. Then we can also compute where the cameras and the other points are in the um, world reference frame. And we do this via the so-called control points. So the control points are those points which I observe in my camera images and for whom I know their 3D location in the world. If I have enough of those corresponding points, three or five, depends on my setup if I'm living in a calibrated world or an uncalibrated world, uh, uncalibrated camera or calibrated camera, um, I need three or five of those control points, I can compute the absolute orientation of the cameras and of the points in the environment. And also then fix, of course, the scale. How this typically works is I take a pair of images, I compute the relative orientation, which gives me a photogrammetric model. So this means the 3D location of the point in the environment up to a similarity transform. So at that point, I don't know the scale, which is one degree of freedom, and I don't know the, the translation and rotation in the global reference frame, which are six degrees of freedom. So I have seven degrees of freedom left here. And those seven degrees of freedom are then um, uh, eliminated through those control points. And through those control points, I nailed on the control points. I then get the 3D points. And from my photogrammetric, for all points in my photogrammetric model, I then know their 3D coordinates in the world, and I fix the scale. 
So at that point we say, <coughs> given we have a few control points in the environment, given we have two camera images, we can estimate where those cameras images have been taken in a global reference frame, and we know the three location of points in the world. That's great. But so far we did this only for two camera images. And the next big thing was how to do this for multiple camera images, more than two. So with n images. There's something which called this multi-view geometry, and the main technique behind this was bundle adjustment. This is relevant for a lot of different cases whenever I need multiple images to cover the environment where one image is not, uh, the, the measurement precision that I have is not high enough for the uh, precision of the final model that I want to have, um, or because just the object cannot be covered because it has a very complex shape and I simply need multiple images to cover that. There's <coughs> also the <coughs> standard approach um, for building maps from aerial images, so flying with an airplane over the ground, taking images of the ground, and then computing the location of points that I see in those images. That's actually where this technique um, has been used for a very long time, but today it's been used in all different kind of techniques. So whenever geometry is estimated from camera images, some form of bundle adjustment is actually applied to that, um, to that system. And what it basically boils down to is, a, is using a least squares approach and the underlying model that I have is I have my image coordinates and I have here points and images. So they have I points with index I and the images in which I see this point is the index J. And this is generated from the 3D location of the point I through the projection matrix which takes into account the location where the camera is, the, calibration, the linear calibration parameters, and also potentially non-linear calibration parameters, things like lens distortion, for example. This element comes from the fact that we are living in a homogeneous world over here, so scaling parameter, and this maps it to the, um, to the image coordinates that we have. And we basically have these equations for all, all the points seen in all the different camera images. And then the goal is to find the location of the points and the parameters of the projection matrix, matrix so the, that the squared error is minimized in this approach. Again, in theory, this is a very straightforward approach of the application of nonlinear least squares. In practice, we have to take care about a couple of things and in order to solve that um, in an efficient way. A few notes. The first thing is there's an optimal solution to the problem. Under the assumption that we live in a Gaussian world and we know have all the uncertainties available of how accurately we can measure our points, for example, this is the optimal approach that we can take. But it requires an initial estimate and we need to make sure that we live in a Gaussian world. Whenever the Gaussian world assumption is violated, this may not hold anymore. And Gaussian world assumption can be violated, for example, if you have an ambiguity in your data association. We say I have multiple objects which look the same, so I say this corresponding point belongs either to this point, to this point, or to this point. So I'm not living in a Gaussian world anymore. I may have a sum of Gaussians. But it's not one Gaussian distribution anymore. So you have to make a couple of assumptions, like known data association, or need to take care that in your final approach, you hopefully eliminated most of the outliers, or in the perfect case, all of the outliers, to actually get good results. You typically need a good initial guess, which you can obtain through relative or computing relative orientations and doing triangulations, um, as we discussed it before in the first place, uses this initial guess for the overall bundle adjustment problem. One of the key things one needs to take care of is actually gross errors. And the typical reason why we have that is because we have wrong correspondences. <coughs> so wrong corresponding points. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things is, well, what we need to do is we need to observe every point multiple times to have a chance to identify outliers. And um, one thing we typically, one typically does for this one, takes into account small sequences of images, tracks those features, observe them multiple times, 
looks at the estimated stable if there are no outliers in there and only then takes those points into account as, as one example how we can actually do that. To be applying statistical tests and typically we say we need to see this a point from at least four or five to six views to be actually quite confident that um, the point is a stable point. We can provide actually good estimates for those points. Yes, so basically what I said, what it typically does, we decompose the overall problem into small chunks of images, sequences of images. We do an estimation from these small sequences of images, remove the outliers with statistical tests, take only those points which survive those tests, so which are potentially likely to be in liars, and then perform the bundle adjustment with those in layer points. The second thing which is important, we need to have a good initial guess. And the initial guess is typically computed from other algorithms, for example, for computing the relative orientation. Or if I have information about um, control points in the environment, I can actually do things like the projective three-point algorithm or the DLT in order to get initial estimates for my parameters. But what is important for there, again, the initial guess, if we have outliers in our initial guess, that's, that's difficult, that's hard to manage, because the initial guess will be very, potentially very far away from the real true solution, and this will generate very likely to be bad results. <clears throat> we also need to make sure that we are not in something which is called a singular or critical configuration um, for the approach that computes the initial guess, like all points lie on a plane for um, the DLT, for example, or for computing the fundamental matrix. If all points lie on a plane, so for example, I have a camera and I move along a wall where there are, let's, let's say, a poster or something like this on a wall, which generates a large number of features and all those points lie on a wall, that can be critical. This is kind of the second thing I need to take care of. Get rid of the outliers, get a good initial guess. Last but not least, I need to think a little bit about how can I compute my solution. And the main reason for that is that the, the system that I need to solve is potentially very large. Because of a large number of camera images, a large number of points, and this can be very complex to solve and very time consuming. So one of the things that we discussed is that those matrices, most of the matrices involved are actually sparse matrices. We can see this, but the first thing what we do is we take our state vector, and which contains all the <coughs> locations of the cameras and all the location of the points, or actually the location and orientation of the cameras and the location of the points, and split the state vector up into two parts. One which contains only the 3D point coordinates and one which contains the 60 orientation parameters of the cameras. We just kind of rearrange our vector so that it has this form. So the first, whenever if you have uh, n point coordinates, the first three n dimensions are all point coordinates, and then the remaining ones are only orientation parameters. The reason why we do this is because we can split our, up our matrix A into two matrices, C and B. So this matrix C and B, one acts only on the point coordinates, and one acts only on the orientation parameters. And then we can build up our matrix A, our coefficient matrix, in this form. So this is a matrix C, and this is a matrix B. In the way that most, in the, the results, most of those elements are zero, and we can actually read a couple of things from these matrices. For example, if we count along this line over here, we see the number of times a point has been observed through the overall process by simply counting the non-zero elements in here. And what we see here in this matrix B is the number of observed points in the environment per image, basically have this block, this corresponds not to one image, whatever here, this was in this example where nine points have been observed, and some of those images like these guys over here, or this one over here, this was just kind of at the end of a stripe, see only a smaller number of points. Therefore, this block is larger than this block over here. And we can read a lot of information from these coefficient matrices. And if you build our um, system of, or uh, normal equation system, or system of normal equations, um, then we see that how the different matrices B and C act on the different parameters that we have which build our system of normal equations. The problem is this can be quite high dimensional. One of the things one can do is one first focuses on the orientation parameters of the cameras. We started with the general system, linear system, then multiplied it magically with some matrices 
in it to, to bring it to a new form. In this new form, the important thing, we have the zero element over here. And then we have one matrix over here, which then only depends on the orientation parameters in the second part, the, the right-hand side over here. So this kind of this reduced system of normal equations, which is of much smaller dimension because it contains only the orientation parameters. So you can first solve for this and then um, compute the full solution. <coughs> I need to invert a matrix over here, and this matrix is potentially high dimensional. The only thing why this is possible was this matrix has, is a, has a block diagonal structure, so it's basically everywhere zero except the small, I think three, three by three blocks, yes, on the main diagonal. So it can be inverted very efficiently. Just need to invert those individual blocks. This is a reason why I can do this efficiently because of the sparsity of the system. And this was kind of an important step for solving this system in practical setups. Next thing is, can we, how can we actually use this if we fly in an airplane with a camera, observing the ground, flying over the ground, and taking images of the ground, and we want to estimate the location of, of the points, individual points on the, on the ground. So one of the traditional applications of bundle adjustment. So what's typically done, <coughs> the area is covered, we typically fly over the environment in, in, in kind of stripes, and the individual images that we take have a substantial overlap, in the order of whatever, 60 to 90 percent of the images overlap, so we have, we see enough of the same part of the, of the environment and we observe um, distinct points over multiple images. And then <coughs> I said, what do we know about the geometry? And we talked a lot about that. So and what kind of control points do you need you know, to do that and where should those control points be located? So one of the things is that the full control points are typically on the border of the area they want to cover. So these are these uh, these triangles with a circle in there. This is a full control point. And we typically don't need them so much inside. It's, a, it's, it's typically sufficient if I um, kind of surround the area that I'm mapping with those full control points. So full control points were points where the x, y, and z coordinate is known. What I need in the middle are these kind of height control points, so a point where I know the height to avoid this kind, this kind of roll effect of so the airplane rolls that have an effect of that, or you can let the airplane roll and then you would actually get um, hills in the environment. If you don't want that, which you typically do not, then you need those height control points in the environment. And the uncertainty of the location of all the new points that I'm going to estimate depends on several parameters. How many control points do I have? Where are those control points located? Um, and one of the outcomes wa was control points on the outside, height control points in the inside. Uh, along the overlaps of those stripes. However, I have to say, whenever GPS information is available, this becomes less of an issue. Because if I have a good GM, uh, GPS and IMU system on my airplane, I basically add a control point into the, um, into the prediction center of the cameras for every exposure. I still may want to have some control points on the ground for making a reference to an existing map or something like this. Or to connect this with, with other map information. But in general, for solving the bundle adjustment problem, this GPS IMU combination substantially simplifies the problem involved in here. Also, we have very, typically very good initial guesses where the, where the A plan was, where the cameras was, which substantially simplifies the problem. <coughs> in general, we can say that the, the advantage of t using aerial images for building maps is compared to measuring individual points on the ground. But I get quite accurate estimates, so the uncertainty in the XY location is in the order of 2.5 centimeters, something along these lines, typical applications. But we get this for a whole area, not for some individually points measured on the ground. So the advantage is that I simply me basically measure an area with my whole image, and I can nail down po quite a large number of points and get their 3D coordinates compared to measuring distinct points on the ground, which is one of the big advantages of this technique here. And we said, okay, we have done this, all this stuff has been done, but what we assume to know so far was where are my distinct points, what my distinct points are. So always assumed we have our corresponding points. And then we looked into one of the things is how can we actually find those corresponding points, those features, 
in our image. We just looked as one example at one popular approach with the SIFT features, which is one type of features, which what it basically does, we look or looks for locally distinct points, which I can localize well, quite, quite related to the first operator that we discussed in photogrammetry one. Not the same, but related in how the points are selected. And then for a selected point, I inspect the neighborhood of this point and I basically compute a distribution or histogram over the different gradients that I find in there. So look into the, in the different gradients, in different directions, basically build a histogram from then or build different histograms in local areas. And this gives me a feature descriptor. So different between a key point, which is basically the location of the point in the image, a point that I can localize well, and the descriptor of this key point. And this descriptor results typically from the local neighborhood of this point. So something which is com com compute in, computed in the local neighborhood of this point. For example, with this histogram or a histogram of those gradients. This is one example how this can be done. And SIFT is one of the very popular features uh, which I used since whatever, 15, 16, 17 years, something along these lines. If we can detect those points in an image, I can do this in two images. So I have two images like this. So the, then the question is, what the correspondence is between those points? So how do I know that this red point over here actually corresponds to this red point over here? One of the things I can do is I can compare those feature descriptors. And com let's say I can compute the difference, so the difference of those vectors. Every key point has this vector, this descriptor, and can simply compare them. That works well for most of the points, or for a large number of the points, but will also introduce wrong data associations. Because simply they are structures which, look, which are repetitive, which, look, which are locally distinct, but which occur multiple times in the image. This is one source for data association failures. <clears throat> well, the, the points are kind of stable under viewpoint changes, but if you have very strong or severe viewpoint changes, um, the matching may even not work anymore. And one technique to separate this set of correspondences into right or correct correspondences and incorrect correspondences, so inliers and outliers, was the RANSEC algorithm or random sample consensus. And the idea of RANSEC is actually surprisingly easy. It's basically a trial and error approach. I just say, I just pick a small number of correspondences and I assume they are correct. And then I basically, okay, they are correct. I compute the transformation behind, um, involved in that, or the, the parameters of my model, and then say, which of all the other correspondences are actually in line with this transformation or with the assumption that I made? And then I rate them as inliers and outliers. And I simply repeat the process. I randomly draw again a couple of samples. For example, compute the relative orientation of those two images and then see which of the other points would correspond given that this would be the right transformation. And I can do this for a large number of different techniques. I have this example with fitting a line. So this is my data set and I want to fit a line through that. And some of the points are inliers, some of the points are outliers. And what is the largest mutually consistent set of data points there, through which I can actually fit a nice line over here. And the approach again is very simple. The first thing I do, I sample the smallest number of possible points to build a line. I need two points to fit a line. So I randomly select two points, like the two green ones over here, and I fit a line through that. That's my line. And I simply say, which points are close to this line? I said, okay, I have a certain threshold over here. So I have one, two, three, four. It should actually be a four. Of course, I don't count the green points in here. I mean, you, you can do it because it's the same number, simply constant offset. If you do it all the time, it doesn't matter. But um, it should be four. So four inlier points. Let's say, okay, simply uh, I, re, I, uh, um, I re run the algorithm multiple times and say, okay, let's try again. Sample two other points. So I sample those two green points over here, fit a line through this, count the number of inliers, and now the number of inliers is much larger. I simply repeat this process until I find the largest possible number. So whatever it is, once, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 times. I, depends. The more often I try, the more certain I get about my result. And simply take the largest set of mutually consistent data points and use this to fit my model and say, all the red guys here are now outliers and not considering to fit my line. Once I identified them as inliers and outliers, I made 
do a better approach than just using those two points for estimating the line and may do a least squares fit to that as one example. You can use this for different things like for example feature based alignment of images. So these are all the features that I have and then I simply try to find correspondences based on a feature descriptor. For example the SIF descriptor that I have. And then I may get those connections over here. So these are the best matching features that I found. Some of them are correct, look correct, so there are a couple of them which seem to be quite consistent, but some of them which are completely off, like this one over here, those long lines connecting them, just because this local area here and this local area here simply look similar, sorry, simply look similar. So what I do, I compute, have the possible matches, and then I run my loop and say, okay, I simply take a small number of those matches, I hypothesize a transformation of those two images, for example, computed from these three pairs, and then simply I verify this transformation by simply counting the number of data associations which are consistent with the transformation computed from those three. And I simply repeat this process over and over and over again until I find the largest set of correspondences which agree, which I then can use to actually align those images. And this is one of the standard techniques, RANSEC, which is used in a large number of different fields whenever you have data points which have inliers and outliers. The, the key thing is how many points do I need to sample in order to provide the, the set of inliers without any outliers with a high confidence? That's a key question. So how often do I need to repeat this process? How, do, how often do I need to fit this line in this example? You know, to guarantee a good fit. Guarantee in the sense of a probabilistic guarantee. Let's say 99.9% .9 of the cases or 99.99999% of the cases. The higher my confidence should be, the more trials I need. Which should be rather obvious. The number of trials also depends on the outlier ratio of inliers and outliers in my data set. So the more outliers I have, the more trials I need. And last but not least, it depends on the number of points I need to sample to estimate my model. So the points in this line example just needed two points to fit a line. And the larger this number gets, the more trials I need. And this grows very quickly. Therefore, RANSEC works well, let's say, up to 10 parameters maybe. That's one of the reasons, again, why the five-point algorithm was so popular compared to the eight-point algorithm, because it reduced the number of, of trials that I actually need in here. Okay, then we also looked into autophotos. So how to actually generate autophotos. So one example, this is a typical aerial image which is uncorrected, and if you overlay this, for example, as a GPS coordinate, um, in some areas of the image this may fit well, in other areas it may not fit well just because through the projection of the image. And the idea of the autophotos was, okay, given that I have a real photo taken from here, how can I correct this image so that I can actually do measurements in, this, in the image plane directly? And the idea was to basically, if this is the surface that I have, I put a grid below the surface, and then I need to, comp need to map the pixel from my image onto this, onto this grid down here. So they can then measure directly in this environment. What I need for that is, of course, I need to know where those images have been taken. And I need to know the surface. So I need a digital surface model. So I need to know the height of those elements in here. Otherwise, I will simply make a wrong data association of image pixels to pixels in my autophoto. So you can see this, if this height estimate would be wrong, if this, let's say the point would be much lower, then the ray would actually pass longer and intersect at a different position and then let's say end up at a different pixel down here. So the main sources of errors in these autophotos was an incorrect digital surface model. So if you simply have wrong information in there. The reason can be buildings are not well modeled, especially if you have skyscrapers. They can be easily 100 meters taller than uh, the, the object or the, the ground and therefore this can lead to serious errors. The other thing are occlusions. So if you have strong occlusions in this, 
in the viewpoint from where the camera has been taken, um, then this may lead to errors in these autophotos. Again, autophotos are also one of those standard techniques for taking images, doing the correction, and in order to um, have a 2D image in which I can directly measure. There's also something, how to generate autophotos is something which is of quite practical relevance and which I suggest you to have a look to that again. Last night, but not least, we looked into recursive state estimation. It was kind of the last block um, after Christmas, which was restarted. So the key idea was to not have all the data available at hand, beforehand, and then compute one solution. The idea was to incrementally, recursively compute a solution. So whenever the first measurement arrives, I start with my computation. When the second measurement arrives, I update my belief that are computed based on the first measurement to have the best possible leave at time t equals 2. And then I repeat this process. So whenever new measurements come in or new controls are executed, then um, I update my belief based on the new information that I have. And so we introduced the base filter as the, the basic framework for doing recursive state estimation. The two things that the base filter needs, it kind of, it's, a, it's a general framework, it needs a motion model, so which tells how does the state change based on controls, and it needs to have an observation or measurement model, so giving me some, some information about the measurement that I have. In a special case, we typically need it in a form that we can compute a predict, if given we know the state, we can compute a predicted measurement and then compare in the end what we predicted, the measurement we predicted and the measurement that we received, and based on the difference, do a, do a correction. We can also do the whole derivation for this. And this is kind of the base filter derivation. We did that in detail here in the course. And it's one of the very key derivations that I regard as important. Because it tells you how to come from the general belief, the system at time t, given the observation and the controls, by doing things like applying base rule, mark of assumption, law of total probability, and one single independence assumption. And the independence assumption was kind of ignoring the last control command from here to here. I can derive a, a recursive belief which tells me how I can update my belief from time t minus 1, taking only into account the control command, how the state evolves, this is the motion model or transition model, and the observation model. So the likelihood of the observation given the state can turn this belief about the state at time t minus 1 into the belief about xt. And this is a key important element to fully understand, to, to fully understand what's going on there. I understood what's going on here. So this is a key derivation which I regard as very important. If you look to this final equation over here, there are a few things that we need to specify if we want to implement this general framework into a concrete algorithm. What we need is we need to represent this belief. So is it a Gaussian, is it not a Gaussian? Something like this. So there are design decisions about the belief involved. And there are two models. Again, motion model and measurement model or observation model. And those two I need to specify as the user. And again, the question is, how can I express this? Are these Gaussian distributions? Are there nonlinear functions involved? And these are the key design decisions to decide which algorithm we implement, we choose, which implements a, base, uh, a recursive base filter. So the two key things is the motion model and the sensor or observation or measurement model. Taking into account the motion model is something we've called the prediction step. So I do a prediction based on the control. I evolve my state from t minus 1 to t only taking into account the control, not taking into account the observation. That's the prediction that I do. The second step is the correction step, where I take into account my observation and correct the prediction with my observation. Prediction step, correction step, two important steps, and the two basic equations here by just splitting up what we have seen before. Besides talking about the base filter in general, we then looked into a concrete implementation of the base filter, the Kalman filter. The Kalman filter is the optimal estimator for the linear Gaussian case. That means those models are linear and everything is Gaussian. Under this assumption, the Kalman filter is the approach that you should take. It basically has those two key models in here. It says 
So there's a prediction step. The state evolves from time t minus 1 to t by having a matrix AT which tells me how does the system behave without any control being executed. And a second matrix B which tells me how is this state changed given I execute a control plus some zero mean Gaussian noise. And for the sensor we have exactly the same thing. The matrix C is a mapping from the state space into the space of observations telling me what is the expected observation that I get. So given I know the state the system is in, what do I expect to observe? This is what this equation tells me. And this again, zero mean Gaussian noise term. So what the approach basically does, it takes a Gaussian and it evolves the Gaussian based on this function. So it propagates the Gaussian forward with mean and covariance matrix. And what it then does, it computes a predicted observation according to this equation, taking the predicted state, estimating what I should measure and compare it to what I measured in reality. And based on this mismatch, I do a correction. That's basically what the common filter does. So again, we have these key components. Matrix A which is an n by n matrix, so mapping from the state space to the state space, telling me how does the system evolve without controls. I have the matrix B, which maps from the state of controls into the change in state space. So in this case, from an L-dimensional control vector to the N-dimensional state space, how does the state of the system change by executing the control command U? And we have the matrix CT, which describes, which maps from the state space N-dimension to the K-dimensional observation space, and which tells me what do I expect to observe given I know the state. Again, we have these two quantities, which is zero mean Gaussian noise, and we have a covariance matrix R and Q involved in that. Typically, at least in the notation I use, R is the uncertainty of the motion, Q is the uncertainty of the observation. There are other books which do it the other way around. If you don't take this notation, you need to specify that for the exam. If the exam covers something with the Kalman filter and you use R, I assume it is the noise and the motion, for example, unless you specify differently. It boils down, in the end, to the Kalman filter algorithm, which is basically a prediction step and a correction step. And the basic thing was the prediction step for computing the mean and the covariance matrix. Then we have the Kalman gain, which is basically a weighting factor which tells us how much should we trust the observation and how much should we trust the prediction. If the sensor is perfect, we trust only our sensor measurement. If my, no, so, sorry, if the prediction is perfect and the sensor is very bad, I trust only the prediction. If the sensor is perfect, I trust my sensor can basically ignore my prediction. So we actually have derived that or shown that uh, how this can be achieved or how this reflects how the Kalman gain looks like, at least for the 1D case. So this is a correction step, which is basically a weighted mean between the prediction and the correction. <coughs> this is the basic Kalman filter. And we said, OK, how does it look like for a nonlinear system? So Kalman filter assumed linear models. So in this case, linearity doesn't hold anymore. And we have a nonlinear function with zero mean Gaussian noise and a nonlinear function for the observation with zero mean Gaussian noise. And this led to the extended Kalman filter algorithm, where the extended Kalman filter is very similar to the Kalman filter. On the first glance, it looks exactly the same. The only difference is the linear model is replaced by the nonlinear function here and here. And instead of the matrix A and C, I have the Jacobians of the nonlinear functions in there. Because what the Kalman filter or extended Kalman filter does it just linearizes the nonlinear functions and uses the linear, linear, linearized function and then basically applies the regular Kalman filter. This is an approximation, but as long as A, the, the nonlinearities are not too severe, and B, the noise is not too large, it actually works quite well. If the noise is very large and or I have strong nonlinearities, the system is likely to not work that well. 
So the extended Kalman filter is simply an extension of the Kalman filter. It can be seen as a hack because the hack is basically just linearized. We can't handle nonlinearities. We just linearize and say we are happy. It's not a new algorithm. The problem is if I would change the function to a nonlinear function, the Gaussian would not be a Gaussian anymore because if I transform a Gaussian distribution on a nonlinear function, it is not a Gaussian anymore. So by allowing for nonlinear functions, which I don't linearize in, in one or the other way, I would relax this assumption of Gaussian distributions. And as I'm just computing the mean and the covariance matrix over here, that's the issue that we have. And then last but not least, we looked into the simultaneous localization and mapping or SLAM problem using exactly the framework that we introduced. So the idea is to build a map of the environment, so estimate the location of features in the environment and the current state of the system in terms of where the platform is. We said we can do this with the EKF, with the Kalman filter. Our states vector looks like this, so we have a three or six dimensional state of the system, current state of the system, and then a 2n or 3n, depending if you're in a 2D or 3D world, dimensional state space over here representing the locations of the landmarks in the environment and the corresponding covariance matrix. So, covariance matrix about the features, covariance matrix about the pose, and the correlations as well. And they said, okay, we have a prediction. So, under the assumption that the environment doesn't change over time, the prediction state is basically only evolves how the robot or the sender move through the environment. And the motion increases the uncertainty. This leads to an update of my state space only in the location of the platform, because I don't change the landmark location. But in terms of the covariance matrix, I actually need to update also those elements over here. I actually derived this was the result of the, um, of the multiplication with the Jacobian. Well, the, the, what the next step does, it does a measurement prediction. So based on the current best estimate and the current prediction, we predict what we should observe. Then we check what do we observe and compare what we expect to observe and what we observed in reality. This then leads to a computation of the, computation of the Kalman gain and then directly to the update. And the update step typically updates potentially the whole state vector. So I'm updating the pose, I'm updating landmark locations, and the full covariance matrix. And if you kind of look how this evolves, we have this example. We have a, so what you see here is actually the, the correlation between those landmarks. This, how the system moves through the environment, moves through the environment, maps the environment, and what we got out here was kind of this checkerboard pattern. So it means I've always dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright pixels over here. Which basically tells, uh, given that these are all landmarks, and only this guy over here is the state, the X, Y, Z location in this case of the platform. Well, this checkerboard pattern tells me is that all the X correlations, uh, all the X locations of the landmarks are strongly correlated. All the Y locations are strongly correlated, but there's a small correlation between X and Y. There's a typical pattern that I observe and I reobserve the environment over and over again. So if I fix the X location of one landmark, external knowledge, this X location of one landmark is that one. I can fix all the others very well, but I don't gain any information about the Y location. Yes, please. Um, the white line corresponds to the orient current orientation of the platform. So this is a third dimension. So the first line is X, Y of the platform, and the orientation of the platform. Last but not least, we looked into the loop closure. Not explicitly, but just the effect of a loop closure. Loop closure means the platform drives through the environment, re-enters a location, and re-observes something it has observed quite a while ago. And these so-called loop closures can lead to a dramatic reduction of uncertainty. So we had this example. So the platform started here. So those landmarks are very well estimated. As the platform moves through the environment, the uncertainty increases because motion always adds noise to the system until we are here. And then we reobserve parts that we have seen before. And this leads to kind of a relocalization effect. So by the integration of the next sensor reading, actually the uncertainty is dramatically reduced in all estimates over here. There's something which is called a loop closure. The important thing is that this loop closure is done the right way. If there's a wrong loop closure, so error on data cessation, 
can be very harmful because it will ruin the belief. The filter will, is likely to diverge at wrong loop closures. This brought me to the end of this short 90 minutes summary of the photogrammetry one course. So we started, again, just looking at the geometry of two images, which is very important to understand how this is set up. Then we said, okay, what can we tell about the relative location of the cameras taken which had observed the scene? How can we formulate that? Then we said, how can we estimate that based on corresponding points? If we have the orientations, how can we then estimate the location of features in the environment? And then how we can we do that jointly? In the end, how can you do this recursively, also taking into account information about the motion? For example, the motion model over here was not used in the bundle adjustment approach at all. We could add that if we have information about how the camera has moved from an external sensor, from an external model. We could add this information as additional error terms to bundle adjustment, which is not in the standard formulation, but we could do so. It was done here in this recursive state estimation. There are, of course, today, combinations of those systems. So bundle adjustment, recursive state estimation is not kind of two different distinct things. They're actually intermediate solutions between them um, and a large number of different approaches that had been presented out so far in the past. So my goal was today of this lecture is to give you kind of a summary of what is going on and focus your attention on some of the key aspects. These are kind of the key aspects I could put into 19 min 90 minutes. There are, of course, other things which are important. But I tried to give kind of a short wrap-up of what you should have learned and understood in this Photogrammetry 2 course. That's it from my side. I wish you all the luck with the exam. Whenever you have a question, there's Susanne and Matthias who are available, who should have sent an email yesterday, a day before yesterday. So, yes, they did, it, they did this yesterday or the day before yesterday. Um, that they are available at given points in time in the lecture hall. If there are additional questions, they're very urgent. You can go to their office and ask them. We have set this kind of two hours of asking questions just to prevent 60 people showing. Uh, up all the time in their offices, which can get a bit complicated. But if you have a question you need to nail down, ask them or come to me, come to my office, ask me your questions directly. I'm more than happy to help you. That's it from my side. I hope I stimulated your interest in photogrammetry and problems related to photogrammetry. I hope to see you again for your bachelor thesis or some of the, you I know, some of them I, I don't know. Um, so if I will see you for your bachelor thesis, I hope I stimulated your interest or hopefully I will see you definitely all in the master program. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that course. And yeah, good luck for the exam. Thank you very much.